I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. I can do the job, but running the business is quite difficult. But a lot of tradesmen lack, and I was probably one of them, is business skills. I don't mind making mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Information is all around you in the minds of people that work beside you. This is episode seven of Trench Talk. I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is the podcast where we go into the trenches and talk not to those who are orchestrating from up high, but to those who are actually in the trenches honing their craft. That may be in the world of business, sport, entertainment, anyone who is on the front lines doing amazing things. Today, I spoke with Ben Sorfawara, whom I regard as one of the most interesting people that I've ever met. I know Ben as a yoga teacher and a healer, but he's also an actor, a dancer, a painter, and generally an all-around creative guy. I recently saw him live on stage in the Melbourne Theatre Company's production of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, Ben's also had TV roles in shows such as Kath and Kim, Halifax FP, and the miniseries Molly, based on Molly Meldrum's life. If that's not enough, he's also modelled for Ralph Lauren, been on the cover of Vogue magazine, and currently works with some of the biggest names in show business both here in Australia and in the United States. We discuss the evolution of yoga, Ben's personal journey with the practice, his own teaching philosophy and techniques before we venture a lot deeper to cover death, past lives, the reincarnation of our souls, and the regression work that Ben does. This episode is definitely not for the faint-hearted or anyone who's unwilling to challenge conventional thinking. You can find Ben at bensorfawara.com and on Instagram under his own name. Enjoy my chat with Ben Sorfawara. Ben Sorfawara. Did I get it right? Yes, that's it. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, mates. No now, problem. we're at home today, my home, because we just finished doing a session upstairs, which you come in and do with us yeah. every Friday. Right. We were just talking before we started recording about the different ways that yoga is taught and that I had a conversation with my brother this morning who's lives in the States but he's been going to a yoga studio for a little bit now and it's exactly the same all the time so can you go through why your classes are never the same even if they're in the same place with the same people there are different styles of teaching yoga just as there are different ways of uh, approach to spirituality. We all have certain abilities that we have had developed of us. The way I teach my sessions or anything spiritual that I do, yoga just happens to be one of them because I've been practicing yoga now for about over 40 years. I got into it before it was a fad when people used to roll their eyes when you mentioned the word yoga. Because I have the abilities to be able to hear and feel and see. When I am teaching, I teach as I more or less what you, you may use the word customize the session to the uh, class that I'm teaching at the time. I have group sessions sometimes that about 40 or more people as you've been to some of them before. When I walk yeah. into my classes, I don't have things set up for a class pre-set because I know that the class I'm going to will always be different as to what people need. Sometimes there are people going through depression, someone's got a headache, someone's got anxiety, someone has, you know, breathing issues, you know, like asthma and so on, which is why at the start of my classes, I would ask who's got medical conditions, issues that they're dealing with so we can then incorporate it with the sessions. That's how I then start to begin to formulate what I'm gonna be teaching for the class as to who is sitting there in the class. If it's a private session, the same thing happens. That way, everyone gets what they gain, what they need to gain at the time. These days, I know a lot of instructors are not as educated enough because we now have quicker ways of attaining yoga uh, certification maybe. Personally, for me, I did not even think of trying to want to teach anything of yoga to anybody for about maybe 12 years of practice of my own, and I did start yoga by myself. So therefore, there was a lot of training that went into it of myself, by myself, myself, and the books that I studied with, and my guides that have always been around me to guide me through things. And so when I go into the sessions, I really focus on who's there at the time that I'm trying to teach to, 
And then what I get from them, their vibrations, their frequencies, what their guides are saying to me, what my guides are also guiding me through to do is what I use in the sessions. Hence, the sessions are never the same. What I also say in the sessions are never the same for that same reason. People will always only gain, get what the quote of the day is, of the moment is to what they are there for. I usually generally don't quote, use anybody else's quote, but the quote of what I'm guided to give to the session or to the class as to who's before me at the time. So it's always very relevant to the moment of that time. And you say guided? Yes. What do you mean by guided? We all have guides, we all have angels. We'll, sometimes they refer to us our higher selves. Sometimes they refer to us as angels. Sometimes they refer to us as guides. Sometimes they all of the above. I am one of those who are attuned to their angels, to their guides, and I'm attuned to source, creator of all. What people call as God, the true God, I mean, by the way, the true God I'm talking about, capital G. So the guidance from that, because I can hear, I can feel, I can see, that's what I used to teach and what I do to live my life. So my guidance comes from, we all have this ability. Some people are just not attuned to it. That sort of voice that we hear within us, that's what it is. It's different from your mind, by the way. Who taught you to tune into your guidance? Oh, man. Well, <laughs> now, okay. First of all, I need to say this. I've always had that inner voice with me in inside of me that's always had me to do things, which is how I got started into yoga, which is a, a whole story in itself, how I got started into yoga. Now, it became more of a clarity when I came to Australia and I ran into a, a little old lady. Her name was Sheena, who was a clairvoyant and a medium who, by being around her, started talking to me about the abilities that I have that I hadn't quite developed as I should. And that's how I began to start, because she was the one that told me the voices that you hear, the things that you, are your guys trying to connect to you. And they want you to focus more and listen more so you can have more and open up your abilities more. That's when it really went to a different level. But for her, I would listen sometimes, I wouldn't listen sometimes, because, you know, I was raised very Christian way. And I mean, as an apostolic Christian Baptist, that sometimes those things may be misconstrued as is exactly what they think, what 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 they are, uh, what the belief system is, is like it may be of the devil. Well, how do you tell a difference between the angel voice then or the devil? We are all listening to voices all the time. Sometimes we say it's divinely guided inspiration, God's inspiration. Well, how do you know that? Also, there are ways of finding out and knowing. So she was the one, this lady, that got me to a different level of hearing and feeling the voice or having the ability developed more so than I had already been doing because I was stuck in the belief system that uh, you don't probably want to listen to that, maybe the voice of the devil, but now I can tell the difference because I know it's God's voice in me. How old were you when you met Sheila? Uh, yeah, I was in my 20s. You said prior to that you didn't always listen? Yes, because, okay, the thing is this. Uh, I got started in yoga at age 13. A sister of mine, one of my sisters, brought a book home by Richard Hittleman. Uh, Richard Hittleman used to have a TV show uh, in America on TV for yoga. It was quite known in those days. That was even when yoga was not as it is today because there was no internet, obviously. He put out a book called Yoga for Personal Living. She brought this book home. After dinner, we were flip. she was told us to come see what this lady could do with her body because some Indian guy gave it to her at work. This was in 77 when yoga was not, you know, not what it is today. So I saw that book, something triggered inside of me of what these guys could do. In there. there was a brother in there, you know, an African-American man in there with an afro who could get into the headstand and shoulder stands. I, well, I was very impressed, but especially with us, there was this older lady in there who would have been around 70 years old that could also get into shoulder stands and some other postures that are not as advanced in people's eyes today that was so impressive. Whatever happened triggered in me that night after dinner when we saw this book, the very next day, there was that voice. Go pick that book because I, I could barely sleep. Go pick up that book and try and see how many of those postures you can do. Just go see them. What you can. I was so impressed and moved by it. So the very next day, around the afternoon, mid-afternoon in the living room, 
I went and picked up the book and went to the back pages and read the directions because Richard had half hour program, 45 minute session that you know you can practice in daily sessions. You can do a 15 minute daily session, things like that in the back pages of it around the index part of the book. So I was, well, to my amazement, I was amazed at how many of those postures that I could actually attain, except I didn't go to the show center, the headstands at the time, the downward dogs, the, the plows, the cat stretches, the gait postures, I was able to get into it and I was very amazed. I had never done anything like that before. And so from that point, I still didn't quite get what the voice was. I was just thinking it was just an intuit. I don't know. I, I was not not in that frame of mind of focusing on voices or no voices at the time because I wasn't raised that way. I was raised very Christian. So that was the beginning of it for me for yoga. And, and from that very day, I practiced yoga for the next 12, 15 years straight, literally five days a week. And people, a lot of people would make fun of what I was doing at the time. But I was so caught up in it. Did the did the physical poses themselves, did that, because I, I know what you can do now. It's very, very impressive. Um, did those poses come for you easily in the beginning? Are you naturally a, a, a yes, flexible for person? Me, I would say I was because, I mean, I know more to it now because I now even know that at some stage in life, some time ago, I practiced yoga because, you know, I've run into people that could see. I know myself now, but I've run into people that could, including that lady that I ran into, the clairvoyant lady years later, who told me that I used to be, uh, I used to once be a guru or yoga guru a long time ago, or, you know, Indian guru a long time ago. Uh, but for me, at the time, there was no such thought in my mind. I was just amazed that I was able to attain a lot of the postures that I saw in the book. They like the, you know, most of them are like, you know, beginner's postures of yoga. It's still quite challenging enough. But to a 13-year-old kid at the time, again, this was a time when yoga was not spoken of. Only a handful of people, you know, in America. So it it was quite something for me to see like, whoa, I can do it. And the other bigger part of the picture was within about few weeks of practicing. This is literally the truth. There was that voice again that said to me one time when I was practicing again within, I'm pretty sure it was about a month or so into it, go into the headstand. And I froze because I was thinking to myself, I'm going to break my neck because don't forget every time I practiced, I did this when no one was around because I didn't want anyone to know I was doing this. It was not because I was ashamed of it. It was more so that I was just to myself a lot. Well, and well, I was surprised I was able to get into the headstand and that was the beginning of it all. And everything just shattered from that point because I was able to get into it and hold it. First time? Very first time. I read the thing. The voice said, go into it, do it, read it, go into it. I hesitated for a few moments, like go into it now. Now do it now. And, you can and I it. listened. And I slowly rose up and up and up and I was able to, and I was so excited in it, I almost fell. But I was able to hold it for, I figured out how long I was able to hold it for and that was the beginning. And then finally I came down and I was so elated, but I didn't tell anybody. And from that point on, I had got my confidence to say, know that I can do almost anything I put my mind to. You were, you were, you were practicing in private. What else were you doing in that period of your life? Uh, well, at 13, you know, you hang out with friends, you go to parties sometime, you know, from school. Uh, you but you said sport. you practiced by yourself for 12, 12, 13 years. Did you practice by yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always chose a time that there was no one around. Okay. Sometimes in the bed, I, I, later on it would be in the bedroom as well when all, you know, my siblings were away and everyone was away or maybe I was already out. I'll come back again. Oh, no one's around. Cool. Let me go do some yoga and just open the book and do a few other things and after some time, I knew the postures in my head and I just practiced them of my own. Yeah. In the space I had. And how did you end up teaching? From that book, later on, I found another book. There was a part two. That's right. There was a part two. Uh, at a, a later stage, I was working at uh, a restaurant in Orange County in California. In that restaurant, I, I found two books. The part two of Richard Hitman's book to the book that I had, which had more postures and more regimen to practice more you know full regimen to practice so i started with that and then of course all this time i'd been into acting and you know movies and all that and i had a lot of my you know say you know people that i looked up to as far as in acting goes you know the stars is you know uh, a lot of the black actor stars that were you know that i love like you know fred williamson jim brown all that 
whole group of people, Clint Eastwood and so on, you know, that whole set of people. Okay. Uh, so one day in this restaurant I worked at had, it's a boutique restaurant in a cool part of Orange County. We had a, a bookstore annex to it in the place. And one day I was looking through the bookstore section of it. There was a book in the corner there. Again, I now know nothing happens out by coincidence. I looked up there. There was a book by uh, by Sophia Le- uh, by um, Raquel Welch is the name Raquel Welch the actress. So there she was. She was she was one of my favorite you know actresses anyway. You know, I, she was a sex symbol and all that. I was like, what? Well, she's into yoga. There was she was in the book. Anyway, I looked through the book. She had some postures and there, some other things I hadn't tried. I was like, wow. So I picked up the book. That was my next level. So from that book, I didn't practice again for some time. By this time, I'd been practicing yoga now, I would say about maybe seven years, eight years. So you in your early 20s? Yeah, exactly. Yep. And of course, being a dancer as well, by this time I started doing, you know, working, doing some extra work in movies and doing some, this was pretty just about the time music videos were going to get started. Right. Okay. Before, uh, MT- before MTV. Yeah, exactly. And the we internet. started that whole scene. Right, exactly. So uh, by this time when I would do stretches, for dance, I will always incorporate some yoga postures that I can easily do. That. So he was like, oh my God, what's that? Because they'd never seen that, you know, it's a yoga posture. Yoga, really? What's yoga? You know, if people were hip to it, because in California, people practice yoga, but very quiet. You know, if you're in the hippie scene, you knew about that, you know? Yep. So anyway, from that was how I kind of started showing people, do this, do that, da, 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 and that's how it slowly started. So it was her book that got prepared me to the next level yet again. And this was how I started showing people this, do this, do that, you know. And then some of my friends that would get injured dancing, I would tell them a few things to do. The knowledge just came. I knew what to tell them to do. And there's a, my leg is fine. My knee is better. Oh, my God. That's just fantastic. And that was how it started. Is that, and is that stuff that you learned out of the books that you're reading in relation that to injury? Or how did that from, connection come? That came from the knowing. There was, there's always been the knowing. Because by this time I've been seven years into, I'd started, started studying body, you know, like anatomy, you know, and that knowing, again, I now know it's something that I brought in from a knowledge of the past. Okay. I, I just knew at that age, even though I was only seven, eight years into it, of training myself with my guides, I had the knowing, or also maybe because they also then spoke to me, said, tell them to do this and that, and then they were healed. I was like, so that also made me believe in it more so. Okay, so, and then from that book, then came uh, Light on Yoga, Iyengar's book. And that just took me to a completely different level. And and it was around that time that we started showing other people yeah. in the- yeah, um, In the industry, in, yeah. In the industry. Because people then knew me as the dancer that's into yoga. And so it was then became, oh my God, can you show me what to do? Oh my, show me this thing. Oh, okay, religion now do things. And that slowly started that way. So then when did you actually get into teaching a okay. formal yoga class? Okay. Because the acceptance of those classes mm-hmm. on, in, a, in a big way would have been much later, right? Oh, yes, yes. Well, well, I only started with private sessions anyway in LA at the time. Also because at the time, again, don't forget, a lot of people were not, were not into yoga. Yeah. The only ones that were open-minded enough that knew what I did, also for my performances in dance and some work I'd done in dance and videos and things like that, were the ones that would say, you know, yeah, you, you know, or they were just going through stuff and I was like, okay, you got to do this, you can do that. This helps you bring blood to this and that. And they was like, wow, how do you know all that? I said, well, you know, I've been studying, practicing yoga, studying yoga, and they go, really? Uh, you know, I can help you with this and that. And then slowly the word got out. Like there's this guy that can help you with this and that. And that's how it still slowly started. Because by that time I've been into yoga about maybe 10, 12 years, about, yeah, about 12 years or so by this time. And I was confident in what I could do. And of course, being the way I was with how I performed and my f- f- physique at the time, because I never went to gyms or anything. I just did yoga and dance. That's all I did. So people were always ask, you know, what gym do you go to? I don't go to gyms, you know, and that's how it started. Yeah. The other type of work you're doing around this time, acting, film, dance, I know you've- I've always done all those things. You've always, yep. Yeah, you, you paint a little bit as well, right? So yeah, you've got- yeah, always, yeah. You've got, you come from a very creative source. Yep. What other stuff, what sort of roles, what sort of work were you doing in that industry at that time? When I was- Early 20s, yeah. I was showbiz, just all showbiz. It was just acting. 
Uh, I was into fashion as well because I was modeling at the time. So I did acting, modeling, dance, which I still do now. Acting, modeling, dance. But the yoga was just a very strong part of what I did. Okay. You know? But again, the way I practiced yoga was not relig on the religious aspect of it. My thing with yoga was just always been, which it still is, I more or less align with the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, with the whole Christ consciousness thing, I align with that. What I practice yoga for, for me, which is still the way it is today, is the philosophical aspects of it as far as how we can use natural energies, which is what we also are, energy, to heal ourselves, the way the creative put it here. Aspect of yoga is why I practice it. And the physical aspect to keep your body at an optimum level so you are not easily, or you're not prone to ailments or illnesses is why I practice yoga and healthy eating. So, you've, so it's a good preventative practice for oh, your absolutely. dance and acting. Yes, yes. And I also know that because of that is why I've been, I'm still able to be able to perform what I do because I know a lot of friends that never did. A lot of them still tell me today, we should have been doing yoga like you do. A lot of people that used to make fun of me when I was doing yoga at the time, I mean, and I did get a lot of snickering about yoga. Some people was like, <laughs> what is that? Is it a religion? You know, are you a Hare Krishna? Because people couldn't tell the difference from what. A lot of them now will tell you today, they go to yoga now. It's the funniest thing. That was like, 30, 40 years ago, but a lot of them are now into All their kids are into it now. So what why, what makes yoga so popular today? Because it's definitely, a, it's a, it's trendy, right, to go to yoga. Everyone goes well, to yoga. you just said it. Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, well, what I would say why it's become so popular today is, number one, thanks to the internet. Yoga was tried out in the 60s, but it got lost in the shuffle because there was no internet, because a group of people would practice in it and the negative press that came out about it at the time. And most people, you had to travel to certain places to go see what was really going on with the yoga. And also the uh, freedom movement at the time, you know, in the sixties, you know, peace and love movement at the time of the, you know, smoking all that of the negative press of that made it, you know, not find and grasp hold of what it was supposed to do at the time. And that's how it got lost in the way. But now because of the internet and what people can do now with technology is what's helped it to spread even faster. If it weren't for technology, it wouldn't, I personally don't believe it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as big. Also because also now a lot of people are also in it because of what they can, you know, you, know, you got Instagram now, you got Facebook. They want to put themselves up and get praises and get, you know, adulation, which is okay. That's all right. I'm just saying that's one of the things. And so it's now trending cool to be into yoga. It's just that more people know about it, or is there a factor that we need the practice of it more now as a uh, as a world, as a me, society? For me personally, I live by it. So if you're asking me, I would definitely say yes. It is very important for the for our health physically, because there are certain things in yoga. If you know, first of all, most people do not know how to breathe. Go figure. I'll say it again. Most people do not know how to breathe. Can you? You'll be amazed how many times people come to sessions and you tell them to breathe and they breathe the other way. It's like a balloon. You put air comes into a balloon or anything for that matter that's got space in it, it has to expand. A lot of people don't breathe, their stomach doesn't expand. So most people have shallow breathing only to the chest. And now when they get stressed, it goes into their throat and then anxiety sets in or any other things that can set in from there. When you teach them how to breathe, they actually surprised, and they would always say to you, a lot of them would say to you anyway, oh, my God, I've been breathing the wrong way, and they laugh. Because when we're raised as, as babies, our parents are mostly concerned about our first words or our first steps that we're going to take in life. Yeah, Mommy, age. daddy is what we focus on. We don't even teach a child how to breathe. So that you're left to your own devices to figure that out yourself. Go figure, right? Exactly. There's a lot of things like that, isn't there? Absolutely. That, that's, that, uh, that's right. You look it's back just, and you're like, hmm, that was probably a pretty I'll important thing you, to get right. Exactly. And I will say this to you now. You can be without food and water for two weeks, sometimes even more. And every time I've said this every now and again in a session, people would look at me like, are you crazy? There's no way. If I don't eat for two days, I'll be dead. It's been proven many times. There's been times every time again there's a natural disaster. Any part of the world, go look it up. They start saying they dig in and looking for survivors. Three days later, four days later, a week later, 10 days later, 12, 13 days later, they find people. Two weeks later, they find people. Sometimes people are marooned on the, on the ocean somewhere and they survive without food and water. Exactly. But they're all the Britain. body, that, or the, what you call the body or your body, the machine that's referred to as a body is an incredible machine. 
But they've all been breathing for those 12 or 13 days, right? Absolutely. <laughs> because once you go into a state of shock or anything that you want, you experience at the time, or once you get past a certain level of, you know, starvation, things like the body then switches into an autopilot of its own to then begin to do what it's really designed to do to last longer for you. So do you have any quick tips, things you can do to, in- to ensure you breathe better? What I usually say to people with breathing, because it's the most important thing, without breathing within minutes, you cease to exist, literally. Again, like I said before, without food and water, you can exist for a longer time. I mean, you know, it all depends. With breathing, the first thing you need to always remember is the most important time for you to especially breathe deeply is when you're stressed. Because naturally, your muscles tense up and everything and begin. And we all say this naturally anyway, when you go through a st- traumatic situation, God forbid, and it's an accident, they put you aside, they go, breathe, breathe, just calm down and breathe. We all say it naturally. Okay, so to breathe, keep your spine straight. If you see that standing, whatever the case might be, even if you're laying down, just straighten yourself up. Inhale deeply through your nose and feel your abdominal region expand or diaphragm expanding outward, upward, depending on how you're uh, situated, lying or seated. And you make it very smooth and gentle. Inhale, 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 and feel your stomach expanding, expanding, and that's it. The breath comes in. To go even deeper than that, as you breathe in, you focus on the energy coming through with the breath that you breathe into your body. That literally awakens your cells because you have intent coming with the breath. Do you have any thoughts on the time it takes? You know, you, you, I'm not sure the exact terminology, but you hear of like two two breathing and all this sort of stuff. Like, is it just a natural flow in and out for you, or should it be quicker in and out? How does okay. it happen? Well, see, this is you're now going to another area of the breathing. Now there are different styles and techniques of breathing. Okay. And they have different things that give as effects on the body and on the mind. Uh, there are different ways for you to breathe to diff- that we use in yoga to help, you know, elicit different effects on the body or on the mind, like I mentioned. So there's the complete breath, which is just regular deep breathing, diaphragmatic breath, deep breathing. There are other styles of breathing, like the breath of fire that you use to really, you know, awaken the cells and bring warmth in the body and bring clarity and also just get charged up. Uh, there's the bee breath or the humming breath, for example, and there are other styles of breathing. There's the four and eight breath count as well, which is more or less probably what you're referring to with the counting of the breaths. Yep. And there's different counts as well to also strengthen the lung, to build your lung capacity, to help, to help for example, swimmers to be able to hold their breath longer. There are also different that you can utilize as well, where you actually retain the breathing or hold your breath and then breathe again and hold again, or breathe again, and so on and so forth. So sticking with our de-stressing example that you gave before full breath slow Mm -hmm. and just calm yourself down that's the one that anyone and everybody can do including kids because teaching the kids these days in school or any other places where you're going to be taught to kids from age five and up and able to easily you know grasp it the idea is just to relax and inhale and feel your stomach you know expanded sometimes you may place one hand on your abdominal region and one hand over around your chest region and you feel your stomach expand, expand, or you can sometimes place both hands around your abdominal region to feel it expanding outward and dropping back downward as you exhale, exhale, contracting. And the key thing with that in terms of stress is when you are exhaling. That's that's the one thing a lot of students in yoga don't even pay attention to because they've only focused on the postures. Anytime you're in a yoga pose or you're practicing yoga or any other thing for that matter, and you're already carrying stress, as you exhale, even if you're doing just regular exercise, the quicker you focus on something that you're trying to attain, in other words, your intent comes with it, the quicker you can attain it. In other words, I'm stressed. I want to go for a jog. When I'm jogging, I will focus on happiness as I'm jogging. Why? Right? That's what my intention is. Or as you breathe, jogging, jog as you're breathing, exhaling every time, or every few moments as you're exhaling, as you're jogging, that you're letting go of all the stresses out of your mind. You will clear it and reduce it quicker than just go for a jog and come back. Because you've not focused on what you're trying to attain with what you the activity which you just did. And the breathing leads directly to your intent, right? Breathing the intent and then connects to your mind and your subconscious. So what the breathing is not just the brain, don't forget. It's the energy that comes with the breath, which is what's referred to as the ki or the chi or prana or the viral force. See the oxygen that we breathe in is not just oxygen but oxygen just by itself. There's an energy in that breath that we're bringing into the body. That's what awakens the body. That's what awakens your cells, along with the oxygen. 
Is, is yoga in its purest form breathing? Oh, yes. That's the most important aspect in the meditation. Okay. The so, postures are actually supposed to prepare you for the most important aspect, which is the meditation. Meditation or meditative aspect. A lot of gurus don't even do any postures anymore because the postures, there's what's referred to, and people can look this up, the eight limbs of yoga or the eight parts of yoga or the eight steps of yoga. I, w- I, wanted, you, I wanted you to go over that, if you don't mind. Okay, quickly. There are there are steps of it. And going through all the steps of it for a lot of people, some people may get lost in it. The, what I normally say to my students, because sometimes they go, oh, uh, how can I remember all of it? I say, well, you don't even need to remember all of it. What you need to remember for the most, for everybody, which is general, even Luke is thinking and understand this, is the first two steps and the second step where postures or asanas is the Sanskrit term. Postures on like the second level of the eight steps. When we're talking of meditation, what I just mentioned, the most important aspect is on the seventh and the eighth level okay. of yoga. That's like going to university or school systems. Someone's on the, you know, master level, you know, PhD master level, okay, and somebody else is on the primary level, okay? And that's a knowledge, because then people get a knowledge, so I usually explain it that way. Whatever posture you can attain in any pose, I don't care if you can put your head over your head and so on, like, or any fancy postures, you're still in the second rung practice because you're still on the physical level so remember always which is this ties into those eight limbs of yoga eight steps and which is more important than even knowing all the eight steps separately every person so being the way referred to as a person yes is a tripart being body mind spirit or soul okay it's like a triangle which is why the triangle is very important as a symbol on this planet Triangle, okay? It's not all negative. People need to get over it, okay? There's a triune, okay? And every religion has in their own way, okay? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, same thing. We're all saying the same thing. It's all triangle. So again, people need to get over it. They need to understand what they're saying and not be afraid of things they don't know nothing about and think it's occult or and, and be worried about it. Okay, so the body, it's like a piece of pie and you have to, you know, let's, so now we have a triangle, okay? The three points or the three aspects, yeah. okay? The triangulation is another word. The body is the smaller of the three pieces of the pie. Okay. Okay, the body, for the most part, will no, take you no longer more than 20 to 25%, approximate, okay? 20 to 25% of what, sorry? Of the whole I got it, yeah, aspect. yeah, okay, yeah. So you have the 75%, mind and the spirit. It's uh-huh. the reason a lot of people can be as fit as this and that, and their mind is still in the way. They can't get over addictions and so on and so forth. Why? It's the mind. Interesting. If you go into the spiritual aspect more so than the body and the mind, the b- mind will come in with the spiritual aspect because the spiritual aspect is more important and most powerful. And that's what you are anyway. So in the practice of yoga, the step beyond level two mm-hmm. is the hardest to access it's not hard no. to access. The way I actually teach you, this is why I didn't teach the way I teach. I try to meld all three into every session that I do. The spiritual aspect, I focus more so in my session is what the world needs the most, not the postures. You'll notice something, and this is very true for anyone that practices yoga, because a lot of people that practice yoga will also go into Hindu culture or Hindu, uh, Hindu uh, religion and or Buddhism. There's a lot of yoga places now these days you see the Buddha there. Yeah, the Buddha, you know, statues there. You never see the Buddha statue in any yoga posture. Go figure. Every place that you go into yoga that wants to go into the religious aspect, they have the Buddha somewhere. Go look it up. Yeah, no, I, I, ah. I'm not questioning what you're saying. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is this: the Buddha is in no posture but a meditative pose because it's the most important posture. Just be in a chill pose. When you attain mastery, you don't need the postures to distress yourself anymore. You can just move into it. Let, number one, you won't even be as easily stressed that you have to turn yourself, this turn yourself out so you can relax your nerves and your muscles from agitation to be able to relax. You can just move into relaxation anyway. So you can turn relaxation on and off. Thank you. Exactly. It's not as easy to move in. It's not as tough or difficult to move into it. That's mastery. A master can meditate anywhere. The master does not need a quiet place to meditate. When you're still trying to also Practice meditations when you need peace and quiet, tranquility. There's not, it's okay to have it. I try to teach my, train my students to be able to meditate even with music in most cases. Why? 
you may need to just chill your nerves one day and you go around, there's a park there, you go to the park and there's a siren, go around, you're going to get mad at the world. Some people can't do that. They need peace and quiet. They want to go to it. You may not always be able to go to a place that's peace and quiet. Once you can meditate in noise, like you go to India, those gurus, those sadhus, they're on the corner on the street. There's cattle, there's this, there's that, there's noise, honking. Nah, they're right there in the corner. The man's been sitting there, whoever the sadhus or the guru is, is sitting on the corner there, meditating for five, six, seven, ten. It's no longer bothered by any of that. That's mastery. So your ability to move into that state quicker. Mm -hmm. um, intense is where it comes from too. That can help. Your intent is the key. The more you use your intent, the more you begin to gain control of your mind. Once you have your mind in control, you can move into almost anything you can do as fast, as quickly as possible. You will surprise yourself a lot of times because you have your intent to say, I want to walk over this hot coal. It's not going to burn me. And you can be able to do it. It's all mind work. It's all is. Okay. It's so how as powerful the machine, the body is. The more, the more you, the more you practice, the more, the more you control you have over those states, and the yeah, faster you can, you can access well. them. Yeah. But well, see, the thing is, again, a lot of people are practicing for posture's sake. They want to see what posture they can attain, which is okay to a level. But what's going to carry you through in this life? Because at the end of the day, you do not come here for postures in this illusion, this experiment that we call life, or in this game that we're playing called life, or in the stage play that we call life. What you're here for is soul purpose, soul work, what your soul is here to do. This is why a lot of people are chasing happiness. So as you're in the postures, it's themselves or it's any posture itself, have your intent while you're practicing the posture, what you're actually trying to attain. So then you can use the focus and the concentration of being in a posture to lock in, to keep the mind with you to what you're doing. So then that way, your intent is set and placed onto your mind. Some people may use the, the analogy or the term, deprogram yourself or reprogram yourself by being mindful, which is what the why the mindfulness comes into it. Mindfulness mm -hmm. of your intent, in other words. In your experience of teaching yoga, what's the most common thing that you see in the classes? Like you, you tailor all your classes to get, you know, to help people progress in their right. Uh, practice in their um, breathing and, and other aspects. Right. Is there something that really common that you're that you find? Like what what comes up more than anything else, or is every single time you do that totally different? In my sessions, once again, because I teach with awareness and I attune to people that come to my class because I have an ability to do so. One thing I know for a lot of people that come to sessions with yoga is, or anything for that matter, is a lot of people the attention span and the focus is a key thing with people. So, which is why I stress the intent part, which is why a lot of people also cannot easily rise above certain situations as quickly because they're not as, they haven't learned how to focus their mind, which is what the postures help you to do as one of the benefits of the postures. But a lot of people will practice the postures for postures sake. They will not really be present in it, which is why mindfulness is one of the key aspects of this as well. Mindfulness, awareness, being present in what you're doing at the time with the postures. That helps you begin to be more focused. The more focused, if you're in a yoga posture, if you're going to practice yoga for five minutes, 10, half hour, an hour, switch your mind after the time to say, this hour I'm going to use to do, uh, to practice this, do this practice. And after that, I can think of anything I want. Begin to learn to train your mind that way. If you decide to do something else again, for example, cooking, focus on the cooking for like hour, half hour. And that's just how you can use this meditatively as well. Cooking, there's cooking meditation. There's all types of meditation, meditation, that people also can get into that it, anybody and everybody can do. Because a lot of people will say, I, I, I can't meditate. Because they think meditating just means cross your legs. No, that's a belief system. You can go for a walk, meditating. But when you're going for a walk, don't be in yourself and every minute texting somebody, then you have not gone for a proper walk. Uh, anything so, that you do is intense and switching your mind off to be focused solely on that thing. Meditation just means be of one mind. Once you're of one mind in what you're doing, then you're already there. So focus is a thing in yoga sessions. This is why for me in my classes, I don't teach as you've been to them. I don't teach whereby through the entire time, everyone's following me. In other words, I'm demonstrating to follow me like they do now in Vinyasa. It's okay, it works and that's to a level. My thing is to help people find their purpose in life. That's most important. So some things we'll do together and some things I want you to decide for yourself. And then when they also, I'm also having them work on posture themselves. Once I've demonstrated it, I will give them the amount of breath. Anywhere from 10 to 20 breaths, anywhere from 10 to 30 breaths and do your own. That's the time that you see what you're asking about, that people are not 
literally living their own lives. Because almost every class that I go into, people will be there. They finish. Someone's decided to do 10 beds. They come up. They see that people are still doing it. They'll go, go right back. I said, why do you go right back? Oh, because people are still, I said, don't worry about them. Decide. If you're 10 breaths, do 10 breaths and be proud of who you are as being 10 breaths. People are, are sheeple. This is what's caused a lot of pain in a lot of people's lives as well. So I try to teach that way for a reason. Deprogramming the mind to begin to let people be themselves and be proud of who they are, how they are, and see perfection in themselves. So that's another key thing that I see all the time. Is that your, what's your purpose in life to? I'm a way shower. That's why I'm here. I'm nobody's guru. I don't, I don't do guru. because, And I don't believe in the guru thing. For me, that's just me. Because to me, every guru is just someone that's coming with a knowledge or a soul that's coming with a certain kind of knowledge and abilities to come attain or complete a certain purpose in life, gifted by souls. And the gurus that are alive, that's okay if anyone wants to be the guru, then I don't do it. That's just me personally. Why? The guru's got a guru. The guru's guru's got a guru. The guru's guru's got a guru. The guru's 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 got a guru. Everyone just got given knowledge by somebody like I got given by somebody, so I'm not going to not only say I'm a guru, no. I owe a lot of people credit that helped me get started. On the yoga front, who's been the biggest influence on you? That first uh, book. That first book would have to be one of the top people. Uh, actually, and, and if I'm going to be very fair about it, they all have been. From the first book, Richard Hitzelman, to Iyengar, and he was a, a huge one anyway, because when I got him, I got into learning postures, what postures can do to heal. Because he was the one that I really studied like a Bible or medical book to understand what postures can heal, combined with what I now know from my guides and of my own that I used to help people heal through yoga, you know. Um, and of course, every other book that I've ever used along the way. And then some other people along the way that I used to watch on TV in the States at the time, they would do just regular exercise programs in the States. There's another couple that used to do a show on a UHF channel out of Orange County. It was a doctor, a medical doctor and his wife. I don't know what their names are now. Uh, I used to watch them religious in the afternoon as well. I was so into it at the time, you know. Obviously, that was, that was my purpose, I, I, you know. But at the same time, I was still focused on show business at the time. So it was half and half. But yeah, so all those people along the way. And then there's other ones that I've also met along the way that also helped my spiritual practice, like uh, Dolores Cannon, like a lot of other people that are out there that are spiritual people, Hay House, Louis L. Hay is another one. Uh, there are a lot of names that I can bring up that are in the spiritual movement that have helped me along the way. Every single one of them, I would not hold one higher than the other. They've all been instrumental in helping me remember what my purpose is and what I'm doing now. How much time do you spend studying in this area today? Books, learning more? Oh, man. I See, this is when you want to talk about how I got to where I got to where I do. I did a lot of reading. I mean, I have Books and books and books and books. I mean, yeah, I spend a lot of my money on books because uh, I started a lot from books. But certain things, I, I get guided to certain things that got me started. And then when I got started, but the funny thing about it is then is just with me with books. I got guided to certain books and certain people. But when I will read their books, it was not so much of me getting too much, a lot of knowledge from a lot of them. It was a, a remembering it's almost like a lot of what they were talking about, I already knew them. They are, it's a reconfirmation of what I've already thought of. You know what I'm saying? In the spiritual movement, a lot of spiritual people, when they talk, it's like, wait a second, I know that. i tell you another book that was very inspirational for me, Conversations with God. Oh, yeah. I've heard you recommend that That's, before. Yeah. Yes. I recommend that to people. When I picked that book, when I found, at the time when I found it some time ago, in a way, um, and it was a thing when I was walking down the street, turned around, and there it was at the time. you know. And when I opened the book up, it was almost like I was hearing myself speak in my own head. A lot of things of how I think life really is like, which is why I don't align with certain belief systems. That's all in that book. I often think a big thing about books is one of the great things about reading that you can get from books is just confirmation that you're doing the right thing. Oh, of course, yes. And and the books that I've always picked up anyway to try and read, to try and get some knowledge, some of them give me new things, but a lot of them for the most part are things that I already say, you know what? That's what, exactly what I've always thought, you know? So, yeah, reconfirmation on things. So, uh, yeah. And when you're talking about, you, you read a lot. Wait, are you talking hours a day? Are you, are you talking oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'll pick up books and I'll just, you know, devour it. But I'm also slower than some things, especially when it's the spiritual stuff. Oh, yeah, I take my time on it. And I just really 
dive into them and 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 observe them as much as possible. But again, like I said, a lot of the stuff in there are things I already knew anyway. Because as I'm reading, I'm thinking in my head, I'm speaking to my guides, my angels, and you know, sources coming through me to say, uh huh, say yeah, da da da, and and so yeah. So I have a lot of you know people that are inspirational for me, mentors that I can, you know, that have written books that are now on YouTube channels these days. And I'm glad the world is getting out because it's making a lot of change in the world. You also do a lot of healing work. Yeah. And that's an area you want to move more into? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've always been doing healing with my yoga anyway. I've never thought yoga, conventional style yoga, like especially the way it's done these days, just for posture's sake or to sweat. As you know, my yoga has always been, which is why I do it the way I do it, is to help people awaken to their own abilities within them. Because that's why yoga was given to us again on earth. The earth is moving into a new earth right now. That's what this whole thing is all about. It's not about fancy postures. It's to help humanity move back into its spirituality to remember who it is or what it is that we are. And so, yeah, I'm doing a bit more of uh, more of the spiritual work right now, helping people in other ways, uh, Just not just with yoga alone, with healing sessions of visualization meditations and, and natural ways they can use to help heal themselves of abilities that they have in connection with them and souls. That's how I do everything that I do. Everything comes back to the soul, right? Oh, that word, that word comes up. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, can you, you also do a little bit of regression work and stuff as well? Yeah, not just regular regression, but quantum regression, which is different from regular regression yet again. The regression is someone uh, sits there, they lay there, and you're talking through a series of questions. Is that how it? Well, you put them in a trance state first. And then you, yeah, because yeah, psychologists use it anyway. They call it hypnosis. Yeah. Okay. And then you so go it's a back. Different level of hypnosis. Okay. Right. And then you go back and you ask some questions to bring up, reconnect them to things that have happened in the past. Is that yeah. a high level? Past or yeah, yes, more or less. Yeah, more or less. Okay. So, quantum regression. Uh, this the style that I practice was pioneered by a lady, Dolores Cannon, in America. Again, like with her, when I first picked up one of her books that she had done on on regressions and what came out of some regression sessions about the way the world is and and some dialogue that came out of those. I would say most of the conversation that came out of the her subjects at the time or our clients at the time are things I always thought of how things are. It's almost like I would hear the conversation I can really hear it in my, or see those things or knew those, already knew them anyway. In other words, is the way I've always lived my life. And so I literally aligned with her right away. And I'd already been doing some healing sessions of my own and other medallions of where I did things. From a, from a mechanical point of view, mm -hmm. what is the regression? It's going oh. back in your – Yeah, okay. Fundamentally, how does it – Yeah, okay. Now – On a higher level, how does it work? Because I know okay. it's, a, it's a big subject. So. Okay, yeah, regression. Okay, so which is why I say quantum regression is slightly different again from – more, more than slightly than just going to a regression. With quantum regression, again, again, it's, it's a, being in a hypnotic state – Okay, go into a trance state to then re-access what you've always known or what you've lived to help you then heal what you may be carrying in the life that you're living now. Humanity or humans are still literally barely scratching the surface to understand what this machine is all about or what the abilities of this machine is capable of. Being the body is the, the machine. Body, the human to. body. Yeah, I call it a machine because it literally is. It's like... Any other machine, that, it's like a car, for example. And I'll tell you why a car. There's something I say in yoga class, you would have heard me say before. Your body is like a vehicle that you're using to travel in your journey in life. Your body is a machine that you're using in your travel as a vehicle to journey in life. Your body also doubles as the costume or the outfit that you're wearing on this stage of life. Literally, it's what it is. You choose your own body before you come in here. And a lot of people will say, well, if I choose my body, why would I be looking the way I look? I was like, you'd be amazed what you've looked like many other times that you've incarnated. And people would find that hard to believe. Because they say, well, if I could choose everybody, anybody I can pay, why would I come to look like this? I look, I'm like, you don't realize. To the soul, that's that word again that you like. To the soul, it's like an actor going on stage. The actor does not care if he's going to wear rags on stage just play a part. It's just coming to play the part and go. That's why the body cho that the soul chooses the body. The body that you're coming in with is just a tool that you're going to use in your journey in life and or to apply in the, in the course of your journey and your reenactment or enactment of what you're trying to do on the stage of life. 
So therefore, as you come in with the body anyway, it's less as important to the soul itself. The soul is just trying to accomplish other things, which is what we use the regression for. The soul is probably trying to accomplish unconditional love, forgiveness, compassion, uh, loss, grief. Every soul goes through all this. It is sad. I don't wish on anybody, so to speak, but we all go through it. It is part of life. When we accept to birth anything or to create anything, we also be able to be ready to accept it moving on or transitioning, so to speak. That's just what this place is all about, life itself. Okay, so regression will then help us. This type of regression helps us to go to find out things about ourselves because a lot of people that are going to psychologists or therapists, because now in America, therapists are now learning what I'm talking about. It's going to be the next yoga, believe it or not. I already see it. I know so, by the way, not just see it. Just like with yoga decades ago, someone's been going to complain about back pain. Nagging back pain, I can give you some examples anyway to help you understand what I'm talking about. i give you a good example. There was a lady, a Caucasian lady in America, this happened, that came for a regression. Whilst in the regress, uh, while she came in, in a, in a regression state, you write a series of questions that you want to know about life itself or your purpose of coming for the visit. Sometimes, very few times, people say, you know, I just want to see what comes up. Okay. So what you do is you put them in a laying state, you mm -hmm. know, on a couch or, you know, just like when you go to psychologists and things or on the bed. And just yeah. get usually on the bed, okay? Usually we'll use. Um, and they lay down comfortably. And then, you know, you give them, you know, some directions and you're going through the questions. So you have them ask when they get into the trance state. Whilst in the trance state, we're helping them find out and navigate them through this technique to help them then discover or try to find out the root cause of what they may be carrying as a body pain, as an ailment they've been trying to heal that they could not find solutions to, or the doctors are stumped on. Doctors are learning this in America now, okay? Uh, as an example, I'll give you an example of this lady. She had a back pain that she's had for a long time, since she could remember, she said. And the issue with her was like this pain was on, I forgot it was on the right side or the left side. She, she was said to have had it at. at. She had done cortisone injections. She had done chiropractors, everybody, nothing had helped. So she heard through somebody else that this was going on at the time. This was like around 2008 there somewhere, nine, it happened in America. So she came for the regression uh, through Dolores at the time. And whilst she was there or when she laid down to cut to it, when she starts seeing herself in the first scene that she viewed, she was quite shocked because when she looked to see herself in the first scene that she saw herself in, when the actual whole section started, she was confused because she saw her feet being black. So, so that kind of took her. She was really worried. She, because when we go into these lives and with this style of regression, just so you know, we get shown or we get to see lives that are relevant to what you're doing in this moment of time. So you just don't go to any frivolous thing because you will be shown things that are relevant for what you're doing in this lifetime so it can help you move forward in this lifetime. So it's very specific Direct, that directed, to help yes. you move forward. Yeah, because the other frivolous stuff doesn't matter because you've lived there and it doesn't matter, okay? okay? So she was looking down herself and she was stuck on that and confused like, this can't be, what's going on? This, and she was being told at the time, like, don't worry, just report what you're saying she finally said, you know, I'm a black person. And mm -hmm. then she looked up again. She was in military fatigue. She was in the, in the army, the military, you know. And then she looked up and she was also a man. Now she's Caucasian in this time. Okay. And that kind of threw her off and she was struggling with that. And she was being guided to say, don't worry, just keep on the report, report. She realized that she was in a war. What war? It was narrowed down. Her dog tag was even red and seen numbers and everything else. And from that point, she really she was able to uh, was able to then realize that she was in the Korean War at the time, in the American military. Mm -hmm. And as the session went on, there was explosions going on. Out. At one at one point, there was an explosion. She got thrown into mm -hmm. a ditch that had water in it, uh, and she was dying. As she was moving out of the body. She was saying things, war is no good, this and that. She was saying, a lot of things that we say when we're passing on also gets left in our soul memory, which mm -hmm. we sometimes bring back in another lifetime. I'm never going to have a child again. Oh, the world is a bad place. When we're returning in our lifetime, the soul memory has it. It's in your subconscious. 
Now you may have certain things that you are actually struggling with when you come into another lifetime again, because your subconscious will say, okay, you say you don't like this, you don't like that, okay, we're not gonna, uh -huh. which was the case with this woman. So when she then passed on, in the afterlife, it was seen, they went through why she came to life, what she came to understand and learn or work through in that lifetime. And then from that, when her back, when she was thrown into the ditch, the first thing she said is, my back is hurt. My left side, I've broken my left side. I can't get up and I'm drowning because it was raining. There was a water, there was water in the ditch. That's how she died. Well, okay. in this lifetime now, the back pain that she couldn't resolve this time was on the left side. So while she was there, she was given the right prompts at the time, which there's a technique to do this, mm -hmm. to let go of that pain and let it go with that lifetime. So the subconscious can now let go of that discomfort and not hold on to it. Because it was being, it was get, getting held on to because the subconscious, as you were saying, war is no good. I'm never gonna be in a war again. I, the subconscious, okay, I know what I'm gonna do when you come back in a lifetime because she's returned now back to America. So that she doesn't go back into the military again, the subconscious gave her back pain to hold on to it so that she would never pass the physical. She never ends up in war again because that's what she wanted. So after she understood, She's she came process. back out, till today she has no back pain. Is that I true? Hope. This is true story. I'll tell you how true it is. The dog tag she mentioned was also traced and checked out that black man existed in really? the oh yes, and was in the Korean War and never made it back. It's um We are here in acting roles, going, coming back, going, coming back. If you want to prove things to yourself, because there are those that were out there say, I don't believe in past lives, take a pause from watching a lot of things on the internet that are not that are frivolous and tune into near-death experiences, NDEs, or look up, better yet, kids' near-death experiences. You'll be amazed. Yeah. What they're saying, four-year-old <laughs> kids, especially around age four, is when they're remembering the most, little kids. They were telling the print, there's so many accounts now on the internet, thankfully, and thank God, because they're now telling stories of different kids that are telling their parents that who they've been, who they know of their grandparents that they never even saw when they were not even a lot born yet, and they're saying things about them, you tell me where they're coming from. Yeah, if nothing else, it it, it makes you go, hmm, doesn't it? Like there's, there's, there's something Absolutely. to think about with that. Again, this knowledge was something that was coming on this planet before a lot of things came in, and a lot of religions came in, and, and then some of it got written out of some religions that even had it. And now we're now arguing with each other that it's not so. Your science tells you that energy does not destruct. It just goes on forever. You are energy. Because something yeah. comes out of your body as energy. Well, that's all the proof you need. So which means you never die. The energy goes someplace. So it's no coincidence or it should not be too far fetched. It can come back into something again, come back in again. Okay, there you go. If you want to be scientific about it. <laughs> Let's change tax just a little bit. Good, no problem. Tell me about your diet because... Okay, that's a big part of it. Anyone listening to this should go and Google your name and click on images and see some of the yoga stuff and that, that you're doing. But um, you obviously maintain yourself rigorously in terms of what you eat. Yeah. And- To a level. To a level. Yeah. It's not as Describe extreme. that level for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as extreme as people think, but yeah. I've always eaten quite healthy, even before it became a fad with people like it is today only the last 10 years or, or more. You know, because a lot of what I was eating, they, again, it's like with yoga. People would laugh at me in, the, I would say 20 years ago or prior to that, I would make a bowl of cereal and I'll put nuts and things in it. I'll put, you know, berries in it and so on. This I'm going back in the 80s, especially in the 80s when I was, you know, big in the music videos and acting, doing all that kind of stuff. On sets. Yeah, I will bring my own cereal. I won't eat what they have on set because I'll bring ones that have less sugar in, in America. At the time, there was a certain cereals that I was really into, Total and K19. And then I'll add all these nuts in it. People would literally laugh at me on set in a joking way, but you know, like, oh my God, what are you eating? You know, you're eating nuts. What are you, a bug? That, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so I do try, I, you know, I'm more or less vegetarian for me anyway. And I've, uh, I used to eat meat, chicken, all that kind of stuff. But that kind of went away uh, some years ago because of the process of what's going on in the earth energetically for me. Uh, so things changed because I was telling people that a lot of people are going to become vegetarian or eat less red meat or heavy meats. After 2012, I was talking about this because the earth is now on 5D energetically on earth. 
There are new vibrations coming in that's causing a lot of change on Earth. There's also causing a lot of secrets to be revealed around Earth uh, on many levels. Uh, that's the change that's going to change. That's going to is also what's causing a lot of people to become more spiritual because things are happening to our DNA in our bodies and the new kids that have been birthed are coming in with new vibrations in their DNA already. That's causing them to remember their past lives already and talk differently and know more for their than their age should know and so on and so forth. Diet is very cool because you are what you eat, you are what you digest. It's just the way it goes. What about volume? And what are we talking what in terms of volumes that you eat? Uh, for me, it's even crazier these days because I hardly get time to eat, so I'm always on the go running around with nuts if I do eat, and I do fast. And uh, some of the sessions that I do for me, for example, when I do do my regression, I fast for them because I got to be in a certain frame of mind because I do mine also very spiritually enough to attune to the vibration that I'm getting because I've always done things that way anyway. Uh, volume, I so then end up tend to eat maybe once a day now in most cases. Some, if I'm able to eat twice a day, but usually I have, you know, something very healthy to eat. That's my doubt is that way. What's the longest you've fasted for? 24 hours. Okay. And when I fast, for me, fasting means no food, no, no, no water, no drinking, no eating, nothing. Nothing. So I nothing passes do, your lips. When, I, when I say hours. fast for me, I've never done just fast. I've never done mean more kind of fast. Fast just means no food, no water, no nothing. Just straight up. Okay. Yeah. So you spent a significant part of your career, if you want to call it that. In the music show business, yeah. little like acting. Yeah. Can you give us an insight into that world? What sort of stuff did you do? One of the good things about doing these interviews with people that I know somewhat is that you go looking online for different things and you find <laughs> things that you wouldn't uh, otherwise go yeah, looking well, for. Yeah, so right. I found um, I found a few things. You've you've been on the cover of Vogue magazine. Yeah, I've done I've done Vogue for yeah, I did some print for them for uh, yeah, and I've done yeah, a few things yeah, yeah. You've done um, you've done a bit of mo you've, you've done a lot of modeling. Yeah, Ralph Lauren. Yeah, Ralph Lauren. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Who else? I've done Ralph Lauren, and what you're referring to in the Vogue as well was a Ralph Lauren thing that I did. I did spread for Ralph Lauren um, when the store was open here in Australia. More or less what Tyson was doing in America at the time, so it was kind of more or less what they fashioned it after. And I did some stuff in the newspapers for Tyson. Them. You mean Mike? No, not Mike Tyson, the Tyson, the model. Oh, right. I was going to say. No, 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 no. You know, Tyson, the model at the time was the face for like Ralph Lauren. Yeah, got time. It. Yeah. yeah. And so I was more or less doing the same thing for Australia at the time. Uh, hence the Vogue ads and, and, and spread that I did. And also, and I did some other things for Ralph Lauren as well, the sportier things as well in the newspapers and stuff. Also, uh, then I did some work for some other modeling thing again for Vogue, which was something that had to do with yoga, a yoga spread that I did with another dancer model it's a spread i'm pretty sure the picture's probably out there as well too somewhere because people have googled it up uh that i did as well and then in spite uh, aside of that i've done a lot of stuff in show business here in australia of course in the states as well uh music videos i've done stuff on tv shows Catherine Kim, halifax fp I've, i just completed last year was aired the episode uh the miniseries molly I've done many um, TV commercials here in Australia as well. And so, yeah, a lot of stuff. And voiceover, I've done a lot of voiceovers on TV and radio voiceovers, especially for radio. Yeah, and voiceovers. So with all, with all these different aspects going on, how do you know what to do when you get up in the morning? I, I just go and do it. This is what I say about a lot of people. The thing to life is this. When you're not afraid to die, you're not afraid to live. Always remember. And you're not afraid to die? Oh, heck no. Ain't nothing to die. You just take a breath, you go, and it's more fantastic things waiting on you or that you can come back and do again. Why worry? If you've been through it enough and you remember that you've been through it enough, which is what we also do with regressions. Once people go through regressions, then usually not afraid to die ever again. There's no such thing as dying. It's just a transition back to where we come from. We're not from here. Everybody's an alien on this, in the, on this stage of life. We're not from here because we don't come out of the earth. We look up when someone is birthed. We look up when someone also passes on. So we're not from here. So absolutely, when you're not afraid to pass on, you're not afraid to live. There's one question I always ask everybody, and I'll right. ask that and then we'll finish up. Okay. If you could have one law changed, what would it be? Law? Yeah. One law changed, what would it be? 
I'm not really sure if it's a law anyway. I'm thinking on the spiritual aspect on this, but I'm trying to see what law I would change. What law is that I could think of changing? Let's make it one thing you wish people would underst- understood We're all better. On. I, I was going to answer your question another way, but as I'm trying to answer again, my guys have come in, source has come in, and I need to say what's most relevant. And I'm sorry I have to, and that's, you already picked up on it, because they wanted to change it in a different direction, which is still the same. We're all one. There's no reason to discriminate against anybody. Why? Your soul, I'll say it again, your soul, our soul, is male and female. No discrimination against men and fem- men and women right away. Your soul has no nationality. Your soul has no national flag. Your soul has no country to it. In heaven or in hell, if you believe in any of them, heaven or hell, there is not one language spoken there that is of any country singularly. Angels, good source, God, whatever you want to call it, or anyone that you ascribe to does not speak every language or ascribe to one language in heaven or hell. It's all on the stage of life. To be enlightened, everyone's looking for enlightenment. The key to enlightenment is to see through that illusion that everything that's on this stage of life is just part of the illusion that separates us. Your soul is the same as another person's soul. We all come from the same cloth that is of souls. Therefore, we're all one. This is why they tell you we're all one. We know that we can all come together and be more formidable as a force and as a race of beings on this stage of life, on this illusion we call life. That is all we need to do. Nothing else. Rule one. Let's leave it at that. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up? No, I think I said everything I needed to say. If we, someone wants to have a look into your work or what you're doing, where do they find you? Uh, well, there's something I'm trying to bring out now, which is the new thing I've just started to... Well, it's not new. I've, I've already started for quite some time, and it's coming through from from America, where I'm really uh, producing most of it. They can, for right now, find me on, email me on C No Evil, C E E N O E V I L, C No Evil, not S for Sam, but C for Cat, at hotmail.com. Or they can check me on my Instagram, which is my first name and last name, Ben Sofawara, on okay. Instagram, at on Instagram. So B E N S O F O W O R A. Ben Sofra at I'll, Instagram. I'll make a note of that in the in yeah. the notes as well. But so. what I'm t- referring to is uh, where they will then be able to find me more because I'm gonna, I'm doing my own website more professionally done and properly done. And to bring out my new thing that I'm bringing out globally is B E N be empowered naturally, and that's what I'm gonna be going by. Awesome. We'll look forward to Absolutely. checking more of this stuff out. Absolutely. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. It's been a pleasure. God bless. Thanks again. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's Matt again. Thanks for listening. Just a couple of things before you guys clock off. You can get all Trench Talk episodes at xrm.com.au forward slash podcast. You can also sign up for other goodies at the same site. Just plonk your email in there and you are covered. That's x for x-ray, r for romeo, m for mike.com.au forward slash podcast. If you really like what I'm bringing you, please head to iTunes, subscribe to this show and leave a review right there. And lastly, if you want to contact me directly, type the at symbol followed by Mr. Matt Reynolds into your search bar and you'll find all the social links. Goodbye.